Hey everyone, this is Ben from Uncharted X here. I've got a special little video here that I wanted to uh, share with everyone. And this is uh, an essentially an hour and a half podcast that we held with Randall Carlson while we were all in Egypt. I've just come back from uh, a couple of weeks in Egypt with a, a great group in the December timeframe of 2020. Uh, it was an amazing trip. You know, there was really no other tourists there. It was worth it given that uh, all of these sites were empty. We had a fantastic experience in Egypt. And I've been, I came back with like 500 gigabytes of footage and, and material, and I've been working through that and looking at it. But one thing that we did manage to pull off as a special treat for the group was to get Randall Carlson uh, essentially on a Zoom call for an hour, for an hour and a half and, and taking questions and, and talking with the group. Uh, it was put together kind of all at the last minute. I want to thank George Howard uh, for organizing it with Randall. He was the one who reached out and proposed it to Randall. Uh, and, but then we, uh, we kind of put it together at the last minute. We tried to get a room at the hotel for it. They wanted to charge us like 500 bucks for this, for a, just a, a room and a TV. So we went, no, no, stuff it. We'll, we'll all pile into my hotel room at the Mina house. And we kind of strung everything together at the, at the last minute with, with my laptop and the TV and the camera and my, you know, my, uh, my capture card that I have for the laptop. Uh, so, one thing that did happen was that the, there was an audio issue when we were recording, um, or I was recording, but luckily uh, Tim, who was in the audience, one of the trip members, also recorded uh, through his GoPro. So I wanna say thanks to Tim for providing me the audio uh, for this for this, this essentially Q&A session. And you'll notice if as you're listening to this, uh, that there will be a little, the audio sort of flips back and forth between, between you know, uh, the two different sources that I have. There's about a 10 minute period where I think Tim was changing batteries or something where it's just uh, my original audio, but it's certainly very listenable. And as always, the information is just outstanding. Uh, Randall is just a, a modern day sage. He's a, a fountain of information. We touch on the Younger Dryas, a little bit of plasma cosmology, comets, uh, glaciers, all of, the, all of the really cool stuff um, uh, that, that is typical of, of a conversation with Randall. So uh, this is a little special treat for all the channel members, supporters, patrons, also for the people that came on the trip with me uh, as a little thank you. It will probably get released publicly on my channel at some point, but I wanted to sort of give this out to you guys as a, as kind of a thank you and, and, and something to, to watch while I'm working on uh, all of the footage that I have come back from Egypt with. So without any further ado, I'll let you get into Randall Carlson, live from Egypt. Cheers. Geological. <laughs> 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 so let's. Uh, I'm gonna turn you up here, Randall. Can you can you hear us okay? Let me turn my volume up. Oh, there we go. I see you, Ben. How are you, Randall? You're over there. Can you hear us okay? I hear you great. Excellent. Hey, uh, thank you for doing this. Let Check me uh, let, let me you. give you a little pan around the room here so you can I'll see. I tell you, it. that's always yeah. less than likely to pull something like that off technically, but we went for it. Yeah, I know. Guys, yeah. 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 We love you, Randall. Yeah, you got some more fans. All right, Randall. Oh, but hello, George. Hey, 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 Okay. okay. Well, that, that works, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and let me know if there's too much feedback or anything. But we're just, you know, we're hanging this together with sort of shoestrings and thread and tape and stuff. So, I'm glad it's working. So, so where, where are, are you guys? guys? Cairo. Cairo. Where, where, where Cairo? Cairo? Yeah, just in, we're at the foot of the Great Pyramid, basically. We're um, at the Mina House, which is the closest thing you can get to the to the pyramids here. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. So, have you guys, since you're there, have you straightened out their traffic situation since I was there? <laughs> <laughs> no. Not so much. Northern, no. Northern traffic situation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. I, I, I hope, hope it's, it's not any worse, worse than it was 10 years, years ago. ago. Well, it, is. Um, well, it could be. We're, I think we're reliably informed that they're burning slightly less of it now, but there still seems to be plenty of it around. <laughs> The amazing thing is, Randall, that, that obviously because of COVID and our intrepid nature, we're, we're apparently the only tour in Egypt. We have not seen another tour bus. We're parking and parking. No lines, no nothing. You're at Karnak alone. You're at Luxor alone. You're at Dendera alone. So it's quite a unique trip. Now, we may all come down with the, you know, the deadly flu, but, but we caught it at a hell of a time. <laughs> wow, so uh, you guys are probably being treated like royalty. 
<laughs> yeah. oh, it's it's getting well. chased around the streets by people <laughs> for been yeah pennies. Is, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, so, uh, what do you guys want to get into? Weird shit. Some of that. Where are you, Randall? Where am I? I'm in Decatur, Georgia, which is just oh. east of Atlanta. I lived there for a while. Right. So, nothing too special, but it, it works for the time being, but hopefully not for too much longer. Hey, tell us about your Egypt trip 10 years ago, Randall. Who were you with, and what sticks out? Um, gosh, who was I with? <laughs> was this- uh, I can't remember their names. It was called, uh, God. Mrs. Did Randall you- come? <laughs> What's that? Did Mrs. Randall come? No, it was just me. Just you? Okay. No, she she kept the home fires going until I got back. Yeah. Um, it'll it'll come to me in a second. Uh, you know, I I've been out of contact with those people for God probably nine years. Did you have a guide that adhered to the mainstream, or were they a little bit Se- more? Several mainstream? guides. Well, yeah. our, our main guide she was a uh, she was Egyptian and she was uh, had her PhD in Egyptology and she was a very uh, very. Um, accomplished at reading hieroglyphs. So she seemed to be very open, you know, we talked about a lot of different things. She didn't seem to be pushing, you know, any dogmas on us. Um, And in fact, at one point, she even asked me to talk a little bit about the erosion on the snakes, Mm -hmm. as as I recall. So, um, yeah, it was just um, a great time. Uh, It was tiring, it was two weeks, you know, it's a, did you guys do the Egyptian Museum? Yeah, yes. yeah. 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 I spent a whole week there. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. But I tell you, I, the, the first two days, I, you know, I was so excited about leaving. I didn't sleep the night before. I didn't sleep on the plane. I was two, day, two days sleep deficit when I was in the Cairo, Cairo Museum. So I was just zombie mode. Yeah. Like, I didn't really wake up until we got to um, Abu Simbel. Yeah, some bill. Dude, y'all all, we, we, that's uh, really the main, one main site we're not going to make all the way oh, back okay. on the lake. Yeah, we went to ask one, but no further. Okay. Yeah. 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 But it was exciting. I'd like to get back there and pick up where I left off. There's a lot to be learned there, as you know. Yeah. The one thing I didn't do that I really wanted to do was visit some quarries. I wanted to visit some rock quarries yeah. and study their... Uh, extraction methods, looking at the the bedding planes and how they might have removed. I wanted to do a study of the tool marks on the quarry walls. Just didn't have time. I thought maybe I'd squeeze in a day and I could visit a couple of quarries. But, you know, coming up the Nile, I don't know if you noticed, but there was, you see a lot of quarries over on the on the banks mm-hmm. of the Nile, limestone quarries mostly. Yep. Yep. Um, so that was the one thing I didn't get to do that I really wanted to do because I'm very interested in pharaonic stonework and the methods by which they quarry and transport stones. And uh, obviously, you made it to the unfinished obelisk. Yeah. Today. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah. Yesterday. yesterday. Felt like today. <laughs> and we took some interesting 3D scans. One couple on the trip. I can do it too, but they, they've really been doing it at every site. Have taken uh, these 3D scans you can do with the brand new iPhone. Where you can uh-huh. laser scan it, yeah, and wow. uh, really got some data that no one else has ever gotten here, you know, just by bringing the latest tool. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh-huh. it turns out those, those, the scoop marks in the quarry are almost a uniform, like 52, 53 centimeters apart. They're um, they're almost identical, just based on the 3D scans. It's 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 really interesting how uniform they are and how deep they go. That's the same mark you see, you know, in the test pits into the granite the same marks on the side of the unfinished obelisk and you can also see on some of them where it's, it's kind of undercut the stone and where they were trying to like break it off from the bedrock it's just this consistent smooth uh, like scoop mark it, it is an interesting tool uh-huh. yeah. so what do you think that they that they use those stones <laughs> <laughs> and beer stones yeah, and beer. seems like an awful lot of work yeah. yeah, for butt flat people. Yeah, yeah. 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 
But butt flaps and Birkenstocks. That's right. Right. Yeah, right. Beer and blankets, right? <laughs> but you made it to the Temple of Hathor. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Dendera, yep. Yeah. You got some good records of, of, of weren't those hot, uh, you know, wall paintings and ceiling paintings spectacular? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what, what's your interest in that temple, uh, Randall? I know you wanted specifically to take a look at the ceiling. Well, well because, yeah, because the, the, the degree of preservation, right. um, you know, and particularly, you know, it really seems to portray the whole <coughs> cosmological background of the Egyptian civilization, the, uh, the stories of the gods. And, well, I mean, if you look at it, you know, they're, they're being displayed in, in um, you know, riding in the celestial bark with the stars in the background. And yeah. I suspect there may be a uh, connection there with um, possibly some cosmic things that have been going on ever since the time of Egypt. Right. Um, yeah. So once I get that, I'll share my own thoughts on it. You know, we, the, the lady I was traveling with, God, I wish I could remember her name. She was also a photographer. And um, it was a group. Uh, and she recorded the whole ceiling in detail, had her tripod set up, and we spent two or three hours there while she recorded the ceiling. When we got back to Atlanta, uh, the day after, I guess, we got back, she had everything on her laptop and in her camera, and somebody broke into her car oh. and off her camera laptop. Oh. And, and oh, was I disappointed. And I'm sure, you know, thinking, yeah, well, yeah, I'm waiting for the study on the Dendera ceiling to come out because I'm sure that that's what they were after, right? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately went, sold it on the street for a gram of something or other. <laughs> Grants to be found. DMT. Yeah, this, this has been a 10-year wait for me. So I just like street to... DMT. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually got an interesting note about that Bendera. Um, they had like a sequence on the ceiling. You know, it's like all the zodiac signs. And they're in order, yeah. except, except for Cancer, it was out of order. And then also on the Nendera drawing, Ooh, yeah. um, I think Cancer is also out of place there. But everything else is uh -huh. in place. Kind of strange. I don't know what that means, but I just thought that was interesting. Well, I'm sure it needs something. Right. But again, I don't know. I couldn't answer that. But, you know, if, if um, you know, I can get access to George, you told me you took photographs, so I'm looking forward to diving into that. But I was particularly intrigued about the ascent of the 14 gods into the lunar arc. Mm -hmm. That was the thing that really piqued my interest, mm -hmm. what's going on there. Um, mm -hmm. Because you know, I go back to studying the global, you know, global catastrophes, and one of the things that you know, of course, I'm sure all of you now are aware of the the younger Dryas yeah. and those what? events flushed around the shift from the Pleistocene to the Holocene. And it's interesting to me that you know, I, I probably got interested in the, that period, late '70s, early '80s. But now within the last couple of years, you know, for years, you know, I could say, oh, Younger Dryas, and nobody knew what the hell I was talking about. And I would have to explain, well, that's the, the Younger Dryas as contrasted with the Older Dryas. And Dryas is uh, Dryas octopetala, which is a polar wildflower that only grows in polar climates. Yeah. And by looking at the appearance of that flower in the sedimentary record, we can determine that the climate change and it changed very dramatically uh, multiple times during that transition. So in the podcast that I'm doing, I think we're up to 55 episodes now, 52 of them I think are posted. Yeah. I've been going into, trying to go into, my, my goal is to go into greater detail uh, on the specifics of what happened around the Younger Dryas than any other venue available anywhere. That's what I'm trying to do. Right. This thing. If you want to learn about the Younger Dryas, go to the Cosmographia research and you'll find out about the impact proxies. You'll find out about the climate change, the mass extinctions, the gigantic mega floods, the sea level rise. I'm trying to put it all there concentrated in one source, right? But one of the things that constantly impresses me as I go forward with this was really how traumatic that episode was. And it's clear from 
looking at the loss of species, if we use loss of species as kind of our measuring stick, as our barometer, loss of species is going to be directly related to loss of habitat. And loss of habitat is going to be a measure of how severely the environment of the, the planet has oh, been yeah. affected, right? So obviously, you know, where I'm sitting here in Georgia right now, you know, during the end of the ice age, it was boreal forests. In other words, I would have to, 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 to find an equivalent um, environment to what was in Georgia, say at, the, say at 14, 15, 16,000 years ago. I have to go up to Canada, right? And roaming around in the woods of Georgia were, you know, several species of big hairy proboscideans like mastodons. There were giant camels, the, uh, the, the, the uh, short-faced bear, castoroides, the big beavers, and the list goes on and on and on. So basically, if you look at species loss, and that is representative of habitat destruction, essentially, because when there's a habitat loss or severe change in climate environment, and, you know, if obviously if like the climate of Georgia shifted back to what it was 15,000 years ago, most of the vegetation in Georgia wouldn't survive. And then after another millennia or two, you would have the slow reemergence of, of boreal forests. North of here in Ohio, which was just south of the Laurentide Ice Sheet, it was tundra, right? Yeah. So we're, we're talking about very severe global climate changes, environmental changes. So again, using uh, the loss of species as an indication of habitat destruction, to find an equivalent loss of species in the ecological record of planet Earth, we have to go back five million years to, a, to an event called the Hemphillium. And it was at the Hemphillium you had a, 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 a mass extinction uh, episode roughly equivalent in severity to the terminal Pleistocene extinction. Wow. So I take that as an indication that the events that brought us out of the, the Wisconsin Ice Age in its North American terminology, the, the late Pleistocene uh, period of glacial epochs was profoundly catastrophic. And I've been focusing on North America, but the evidence is coming in from all over the planet uh, of how really traumatic this couple of thousand year episode was. In fact, I've got some interesting stuff and I might do a share screen here in a minute. I mean, yeah. stuff, it was studies that I've been looking at really that go back to what I had pulled out a couple of them in a hurry, but uh, studies on the Nile River and uh, wow. gigantic, gigantic floods yeah. on the Nile River uh -huh. uh, right around that epoch. Um, one of the articles is actually entitled The Wild Nile, and it yep. dates these floods to roughly 12,500 years ago. Sure. And in some cases, the, 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 um, the water level rose to 120 and 150 feet above the modern Nile. So that'd be, oh, yeah, that'd be 50 feet down. above the Giza Plateau. Damn. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it, 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 I, I, of course, don't know, but that always struck me as being a, 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 a logical time for when a lot of the erosion would have occurred. Yeah. Uh, because the snakes would, if it was presuming it was there, it would have been submerged at that yeah. time. And in the eastern Mediterranean, there are layers of what's called sapropel, which is basically there was so much water coming down both from the, uh, the White and the Blue Nile being carried north into the Eastern Mediterranean that it was choked with organic sediment. And that organic sediment oh. flushed into the basin of the Eastern Mediterranean and it was so rapid that it didn't have time to uh, um, uh, 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 to, to, to basically to, to deteriorate. And so the saprolytic muds are basically rotten muds. Mm -hmm. It didn't have time to oxidize. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So you've got several of these layers of this thick saprolytic mud at the bottom of the of the uh, uh, eastern Mediterranean that did not oxidize because it couldn't get oxygen because it was dumped in there so fast, mm -hmm. right? And so this is stuff being flushed off of Egypt. You know, awesome. yeah, organic material was being flushed through the Nile River and, and dumped. So that goes along with the evidence for uh, high water marks in the, in the Nile. And then there are the wadis. Uh, the wadis are almost certainly all produced by catastrophic flooding. And you can tell some of the studies that I've been looking at on the wadis have all of the evidence that you see for 
massive catastrophic floods, giant boulder deposits, uh, things like that, 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 and, that are rounded. So, you know, the boulders were rolling. And I mean, you're talking about, you know, the boulders that are 10, 12 feet in diameter. And normal floods are not transporting boulders 10 or 12 feet in diameter. Yeah. So as, as we're sitting here right now, basically, we've got access to these technologies and this information on the one hand, cutting edge science. We've also got access <laughs> to this legacy, this incredible legacy of archaic knowledge and wisdom that has miraculously been preserved for all of these millennia. And I think the two are sort of coming together in their perfect complements of each other. So from all over the world, we have what, 120 to 150 at least documented stories of gigantic <laughs> floods that basically destroyed everything that was there. And now we have the scientific proof that these gigantic floods actually have occurred in Earth's history and very recently. So what that comes down to, <clears throat> excuse me, what I kind of think that this is kind of to bring this idea around is that, you know, when you talk about the, the megafaunal extinctions, we're talking about, depending on how you divide species up, and there's, there's various ways of doing that, but you're talking about 100 to 120 megafaunal species that, that rapidly disappear uh, in, the, in the millennia or two leading up to the Younger Dryas uh, boundary at 12,000, roughly 900 years ago. Uh, and then maybe there was some post YDB survival. That's controversial. Um, it, it certainly seems likely to me that you could have had some survival. But, but here's the thing. If you look at the number of megafaunal species alive on Earth today, it's about that same number. In other words, now megafaunal species is, de is defined as 44 kilograms in body weight, okay. which is right around 100 pounds. So what that means is, that I'm assuming, looking that all of you are mega fun. <laughs> in it, Easily. Yeah. I know yeah. George is. Yeah. So I know mega fun. Mega, mega. Yeah. George, George and I are getting ultra fun. We got a big one over here too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big fun. Big fun. Big fun. So, big big fun. Big <laughs> so in other words, if we were going to exterminate as many species today as when extinct, at the terminal Pleistocene, we basically have to eliminate every single animal on Earth over 100 pounds in body weight. Because think about that. If a species goes extinct, there's no viable mating pairs at all left, is there? Mm -hmm. Every single last individual has to die yeah. in order for a species to go extinct. And so we're looking at you know, 100 to 120 species worldwide that went extinct over a very, very short geological interval. And <clears throat> the question that, that, that always, early on, when I started, you know, looking into this stuff in the 70s, and I would read, well, the, the, the dominant theory was that the animals, well, at least focused on, on mammoths, was hunted to extinction by Paleo-Indian hunters. And that always seemed to me, you know, I grew up around a lot of hunters and stuff. I've never been much of a hunter myself, but, you know, I, it just it didn't seem, wait, with was fears? You're talking about, you know, perhaps the estimate was there might have been 10 million mammoths in the world. Well, you know, looking at the latest estimates of, of terminal, uh, you know, of, of human population during the, the, the middle, say, Paleolithic, which would have been the time frame, the estimates range between 5 and 10 million global population. So, wait a minute. So you're saying to me that, that for every... And that's total, man, women, and children. So you're saying, man, that on the one hand, there was 10 million people. That's the higher estimate. Over here, the paleontologists are saying there might have been as many as 10 million mammoths worldwide, right? So wait a second. How, something something yeah. isn't adding up here. They were hungry. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I just, you know, back to the old <laughs> butt flaps and Birkenstocks with their spear points. I wasn't putting, it just didn't make sense to me. Well, then at the same time, you know, by the 70s, there was certainly evidence of catastrophic events in Earth history. You know, I mean, going back to Velikovsky in the, in the 1950s, going back to, uh, you know, Henry Howarth back in the 1890s, even, you know, who was a geologist writing about gigantic catastrophic floods and catastrophes in Earth history. But my point is that if you have an event that can decimate half of the megafaunal species on Earth, 
would it not have an equivalent effect on on the human species? Mm. And that was always a question in my mind. And it's only within, let's say, the last decade that the evidence has started to emerge that there really was a human population crash that coincided with the younger Dryas. And evidence is showing up from Europe, from Japan, from Asia, from South America, from North America, that there was a population bottleneck right there around the younger Dryas. Which, of course, again, completely mitigates against the idea of human hunters hunting all of these great animals to extinction. In fact, what they would have been predominantly concerned with was simply survival. Now, this is not to say that in the aftermath, if there were uh, individual animals that survived and people that survived, that, that they hunted. And, and there's no question that people hunted megafauna. But, you know, uh, you know, indigenous peoples throughout thousands of years have hunted megafauna without hunting them to extinction, right? So here's, here's I guess, what I'm getting at. For about a thousand years, Earth would have been a really nasty place to be living during these transitions. There was very few places where you might have had at least somewhat of a of a uh, uh, a benign climate or a benign environment. And so then we get to this idea that's in in all of the archaic literature, which is uh, you know. The most prevalent of the, the ancient traditions is the flood. I, the flood, you know, the flood myth is ubiquitous. It, it's from every continent. And there's over, over well over a hundred accounts of you know world destroying floods. And, oh, oh, uh oh, open the door. Open the door. Randall, are you okay? <laughs> Hang on, guys. And, oh, guys. And some of the other. I, I look at the story of the gods. The stories of the gods. Oh. What? Oh. Sorry, we just we just, we just we just lost the door. Might make a, a difference. Little, a little, I wonder. A little I think we're okay now. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Good. along with the stories of great destructions and the floods and floods and fires, floods and fires were the two ways that the earth is typically typically destroyed in the traditional accounts. Which, of course, George is, as you and I are well aware, that perfectly fits the model of a of an ET impact, right? Because an ET impact is going to have both of those as a consequence. And of course, we've seen the evidence that there were firestorms and great floods all intermingled. In fact, some of the flood deposits have layers of soot, you know, sandwiched in there. So um, what my point was is that the earth would have been a very, it would have been a, a period of trial and tribulation for, for our species to come through that. Mm -hmm. But then we get into the, the corollary traditions, which is the stories of the gods. And over and over again, what we see is the idea that the gods had the ability to travel to, uh, they were associated with the sky, right? Uh, right here in Georgia, uh, up in North Georgia, there's a, near the Blue Ridge, there's a mountain called Blood Mountain. I go hiking there quite frequently. And, and the sign now is well, worn out but there was a sign because this was the this was the center of the Cherokee culture um you know several centuries ago and they had myths surrounding the blood mountain and you know you generally the the, the conventional explanation is that there was some battle there uh and that's why it's called blood mountain i've often wondered if there might almost be some kind of uh, an alchemical type of concept around it but in, in any case it talks about the Cherokees, the sign would talk about the Cherokee myth of the Blood Mountain and, and where the Nunahai, which were the people who could travel anywhere, descended and landed to interact with the, the, the ancestors of the Cherokee. Wow, I didn't know that. That's just, that just one example. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously, you know, if we look at the Egyptian pantheon, same thing. These, these gods clearly have a celestial character. Yeah. Um, how do we interpret that? Well, on one level, I absolutely I can see that you know think 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 about the 1908 event in, in Siberia. You got this the Tunguska event, right? Now Tunguska actually spawned a revival of an ancient religion where Agni, the god of fire, descended to earth. In the area where it, it exploded over that area, just northeast north 
east of Lake Baikal um, was considered cursed, and nobody was actually allowed to go there. And when um, when Leonid Kulik first went there, or Leonid, I think it's Leonid Kulik, first went there, he hired a guy um, who, who took him to the outskirts of it. Then, of course, because he was completely uh, afraid of the area, he wouldn't, wouldn't go into the accursed zone. And he went back. Well, the prohibition against going there, taking outsiders there, was taken so seriously by the Tungustis that when this guy got back, they killed him. Oh, oh wow. so yeah, that's right. my, my point being is that, you know, Tunguska would have been an awesome thing to witness and experience. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, if you can, I don't know how many of you have ever looked at some of the video clips from the Chelyabinsk, which yeah. was February of 2013, yeah. the, the bolide that exploded over the, the Siberian yeah, yeah. town of, of Chelyabinsk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you, you know, when you guys get back, um, Ben, when we do a uh, our podcast, yep. or George, I've got some video clips, and I tell you what, if you turn that volume up, the scare the, the hell out of it. Yeah. Scared the hell out of me. Yeah, that one YouTube, I don't think anybody that's come across it didn't hear that crack yeah. and absolutely jump out of their skin. Yeah. yeah. And that's just right. a damn recording. Он похоже вот это похоже метеорит, вон там он взорвался, короче. You bite, cop. Это взрывная волна дошла, видимо. This fan, yeah, it's right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You know, actually, so, Randall, I'll, I'll actually add to the to talk about Tunguska and how. It, the, the comet research groups work at Tel Al Imam in Jordan indicates the same thing. That for yeah. 700 years, and that paper's in press, uh, I'm happy to send it to you, I might have already, but for 700 years, no one went there anymore. Jesus even makes an oblique reference that you don't go over there. Yeah. That it was a bad, wow. bad time, and it stuck with people for hundreds and hundreds of years because there was an air burst. But go ahead, sir. Yeah. Well, Okay, so, you know, what we have to, I think, this provides kind of a context to where we are now. In the sense that, you know, if we look at everything that we consider to be the precursors to our modern civilization, number one, agriculture. When did agriculture show up? You know, nine to 10,000 years ago, right? Uh, domestication of animals, exclusive yeah. of dogs that we don't, back 25, 30,000 years with dogs, but other species, domestication of animals, 10,000 years ago, right? Dispersion of languages, roughly the same time period. First cities and urban complexes between eight and 9,000 years ago. So it's like, we're it's almost to me like whatever was going on before essentially got erased. And once you begin to comprehend the extent of the global devastation, you can begin to understand where the critics of some of the, the ideas like Graham Hancock's yeah. ideas and stuff, where, where they've missed the boat. Because they have no comprehension of how traumatic and how widespread this global remodeling event really was. And so one of the things that I've been doing now is getting into the whole, you know, getting uh, LIDAR uh, imagery, yeah. which you know, by peering through the, 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 the topsoil and the vegetation canopy really reveals what's under our feet. And I tell you what, the, 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 the landscape of planet Earth bears the scars everywhere of this trauma. And I would say we need to kind of consider what's going on now as the culmination of the reboot that occurred 10,000 years ago, post Younger Drives. Now, the question to me is that when you know we, we we've really we've had a, a period of relative uh calm and um stability for eight to ten thousand years throughout the holocene relative to what came before and you know you, you, you one of my uh 
I guess my, one of my conclusions is, is that we can't be taking that for granted. And you know, we look at the, uh, the Younger Dry's Boundary events, and we're looking at events that maybe brought the human species close to extinction, right? But it wouldn't take much of an event relative to what happened at the Younger Dryas. Something several orders of magnitude less powerful could basically pull the plug on modern civilization, right? Um, and if that happened, of course, what, seven billion people now living on the planet, and if suddenly all the supply chains are disrupted, global agriculture collapses for two or three years, you know, we're in some, we're in mm -hmm. some big trouble. Make COVID look like a sneeze. <laughs> would make COVID, yeah, look like yeah. a sneeze. That's exactly yeah. right. And then, of course, what would follow in that is, is real pandemics. You know, where yeah. you got corpses piled up in the streets because <laughs> people don't get food. They, they get mal malnourished, their immune systems get weak. And interestingly, when we look at the pandemics of history, we see this same pattern over and over again. Typically, the, the Justinian plague of uh, 544 AD, the, the bubonic plague of, I think it was uh, around 1320, roughly. Both of those episodes came on the heels of uh, global cooling, which caused a succession of agricultural failures, which led to famine. And famine led to people being susceptible to opportunistic diseases. And so we see that pattern over, repeated over and over again. To me, we're in a situation now where we potentially could address the ultimate cause. Because if, you know, if I know George, you're familiar with, with, with uh, the work of uh, Chandra Wickramasinghe? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right, okay, uh, and, and yeah. the late Fred Hoyle, and there were right. that uh, possibly even some of the uh, the diseases, the viruses were actually delivered to Earth in, in meteorites or comets. Um, but I think that at this point, we are, you know, we've just, uh, we just had that rendezvous with that comet, took samples. To me, that's a, not comet, I'm sorry, asteroid. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's encouraging because, to me, likely, you know, as um, David Levy once said, uh, who was co-discoverer of Comet, uh, Shoemaker Levy Nine, he said, you know, we can look at all of the, of the the worst disasters, whether it's uh, hurricanes, um, huge volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, uh, earthquakes that, that 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 decimate the human population and cause so much um, destruction and devastation. We can't really do much about those at this point. And he said, but then you have extraterrestrial impacts, the consequences of which can be large scale volcanism, massive seismicity, you know, tsunamis, hurricanes, all of that stuff could come as a byproduct of a cosmic impact. And he made this point 20 years ago. We interviewed him when I was doing um, Fire from the Sky. And he made this point that, you know, in a very short period of time, if we had the will, we would actually be able to do something about the ultimate disaster to Earth. Well, here we are, what, 23 years later, and so far nothing has happened. But I will say this. Uh, just before the COVID thing hit, I got contacted by, uh, and I think this is okay to talk about, I got contacted by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Matt Lomine who uh, was an Air Force Colonel, and he was being transferred into the newly formed Space Force. And uh, we were gonna get together, we met, he came, I built a restaurant, which I mean, you're all invited to Decatur and come eat at a restaurant that I'm now partners in. Especially you, George, I'm expecting you to come down here and try yeah, to get well. chips. <laughs> <laughs> the, fish, the, the fish tacos are good also. Hell Anyways, yeah. uh, so he came, We the restaurant hadn't opened yet, we hung out for the day, and um, he's since gone to, to Denver, and he's assumed the commandery of the uh, of the uh, the base there in Denver, and he's directly under General Richardson, who's head of the Space Force, really? who will probably be retiring fairly soon. So anyways, what Matt wanted to talk to me about was if once they got going, would I be willing to come out to Denver and do a presentation to the newly formed Space Force on planetary defense? No wow. shit. 
No shit. To which I responded, absolutely I would. Damn right. Oh, yeah. Then the COVID came along, so we exchanged a few emails. Well, I got an email from him about a week ago, and he sent me a video clip of his meeting with, with Donald Trump. Oh. Um, and I could, George, when you get back, I'll, I'll send you a copy. We can share it around. It's just a yeah. short couple of minutes. But um, so once Richardson retires, it's very likely that Bowmeyer will become the, will move up the ranks and become the top dog in the Space Force. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, we've become good friends. He's a great guy. And he's really That's interested awesome, in the idea of planetary yeah. defense. So, yeah. Uh, who knows? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. That's the right yeah. people asking the right questions. Yeah. So rare. Well, well yeah. yeah. And so, and, and, and so, so it turns out, out there's a bunch, bunch of those guys, guys George, that are fans of my podcast, podcast and your, your website. website. Yeah. Good. Hell yeah. Good. So, so I just thought I'd throw that out there so you knew that, George. You've got some That is awesome news, Randall. You know, with all the damn emails I've sent, I usually don't contact top military people, but... <laughs> trying to stir this stuff up and it just never stirs but sometimes there's incoming over the transom yeah. where people you know run into the subject and want to follow up i know that people in los angeles you know some of the billionaires are are following you even um uh you you, you briefed peter Thiel, didn't you yes, uh, I did. randall yeah co-founder of paypal with elon musk and he took you out to la to tell him about it so there's some very, very significant global figures following your work, just as um, all us mutts are. Yeah. Well, it's kind of exciting. There's a lot of negative crap going on right now, but in, in within all of that, there's some really interesting potential that could come out of this if we're not, if we just, you know, be intelligent about things and, and you know, don't get sucked into the partisanship, you know, ideological straight jackets, um, all of that. So um, I tend to be an optimist. So I think that, you know, I mean, I grew up, you know, under the threat of nuclear annihilation, you know, hiding under my desk, you know, duck and cover, thinking the world was going to end before I got to be grown up. And a lot of my generation, or those of you that, you know, were baby boomers may remember that and, and um i think that led to kind of a lot of that sort of nihilism that yeah. you know in a way led to all of the things that my generation did in the 60s and stuff i think global um, warming does the same thing to this generation where they've been told totally so. hopeless yeah but you know of course a, a major difference is that the threat of nuclear war was very real <laughs> 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 hey, Randall, I know there were some questions. I know a couple of people mentioned that they came with prepared questions. You ready for a couple of uh, couple of those? Sure. Yeah. Who's yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I can't guarantee that I'll answer them. But. <laughs> Tim, you Tim. start. Say your name and where you're from. Yeah, I'm Tim uh, Gifford from Maine, and Hi, uh, Tim. it's an honor to be able to ask these questions of you, Randall. <laughs> 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 My question is, what are your thoughts on uh, Ben Davidson's research on cyclical long period recurrent, recurrent micronovas and how it... I, you know, I, I haven't looked into it where I can have any kind of definitive opinion on it. I've been on, you know, I've, I think I've been on uh, suspicious observers twice now with extended conversations with Ben. Um, I've got a lot of research that I've gathered together on the sun, on solar cycles and things that I haven't really dove into yet. I, I will say this though, in my studies of, of comets, one of the things I came across was the discovery within the last decade or two of what's called the Kreutz sun raisers. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that every year, dozens if not sometimes hundreds of these comets fly into the sun. And some of the studies coming out of SOHO, some of the other uh, solar observing satellites seem to suggest that there is a connection between the infall of cometary masses into the sun and response from the sun. For example, solar storms and coronal mass ejections and so on. So where my thinking has evolved at this point is that I look at, I'm starting to think of the younger driest boundary events as being something that perhaps transcended just planet Earth 
It might have been something that involved the entire solar system, including the sun. And if we, you know, I don't know how many of you are, I know George is familiar with the work of Victor Klub and, and William Napier and William Asher and some of those, the, 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 uh, the British neocatastrophists who basically have been proposing for decades that Earth was bombarded multiple times by the uh, debris of a gigantic fragmented comet that came into the solar system maybe sometime, the inner solar system, maybe sometime between 25 and 30,000 years ago, and then began to undergo a hierarchy of disintegrations, and that the Earth actually may have encountered the byproducts of this disintegration on more than one uh, occurrence. And that would explain to me some of the complexity of the, the shifts out of, out of the ice age, because you know, meltwater pulse 1A uh, is now dated at about 14,600 years ago. And then you have the Younger Dryas boundary that's dated between 12,800 and 12,900 years ago. Then you've got Meltwater Pulse 1B, which is dated 11,600 years ago. Now, each of these Meltwater Pulses means that there had to be a massive influx of thermal energy to trigger this extreme level of melting that was measured literally in, in hundreds of millions of cubic feet per second, discharging into the global oceans, uh, maybe even billions of cubic feet per second. So, uh, what that suggests to me is this is a possibility. If there was a gigantic comet, you know, nucleus, say, 60 to 100 miles in diameter, and it began to break up, and you had this regular influx of, of mass into the sun, what the Croyd sun braces are suggesting to us is that even, even a small comet uh, with uh, nucleus roughly the mass of Halley's Comet mm -hmm. seems to trigger a solar response. Mm -hmm. oh. What would happen if you had a large influx of material or a large piece of nucleus over a, a period of time? Mm -hmm. Could that induce instabilities into the sun? I think that this is going to be a very possibly fruitful area of exploration in the next few years. And what it could do is it could reconcile a lot of these conflicting um, ideas about was it impact, was it solar, you know, it may have been a perfect storm. It may have been both. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I, I do tend to lean towards the idea that, that the impact is the trigger, that the, it's, to use Robert Anton Wilson's term, the cosmic trigger that can, uh, that can cause all of this stuff to happen. So I am, Tim, I'm amenable to, to Ben's ideas. Um, but I have to admit, I have not studied them to the extent that I really would want to sit here and, and, and you know, presume to be knowledgeable. You know, at least, you know, call me back later this afternoon and I'll see if I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, I've collected together a lot of, of, of recent information oh. on the sun and solar cycles. And it's really interesting stuff. It, and it does seem to hold up. Uh, a lot of the climate changes that have occurred uh, over the last 10,000 years seem to have a solar component, um, in spite of the, 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 the disclaimers by, you know, the global warming faction that the sun has no role. Yes. I, I don't think <laughs> that, 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 the, that the evidence for, you know, um, for, you know, for example, radiocarbon 14 and beryllium 10 are produced, uh, they show seem to show a cyclic component, and that's directly related to solar activity. Yeah, and the amount of galactic ray bombardment, which is interacts with the, with the with um, you know the the, uh, the the heliosphere. The heliosphere generally acts as sort of a buffer that prevents the galactic cosmic rays from from um, you know overwhelming the Earth. Uh, but if the sun goes into a quiet phase, it allows the galactic cosmic rays to increase, which then increases the neutron spallation and creates beryllium ten. Uh, and carbon-14 is a byproduct. So there seems to be a lot of correlation between um, climatic cycles and the, uh, the generation of those particular isotopes, which clearly implies the solar component. So yeah, I, I, so yeah, it's one of those things. Uh, I just I need to be maybe two or three people so that I have the time to study everything that I'm interested in. We'll or I have to figure out a way to live another century. I'm working on that. Um, if anybody has any ideas. Take the vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> what was
Take the vaccine. 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 Take the if you look at like the glyphs on ancient in all over Egypt, uh, it seemed like the Egyptians kept pretty much meticulous records of everything, and it seems to be that way around with other ancient societies, whether it was in India or South America, but specifically yeah. in Egypt. And you look at like how they had almost every celestial body tracked, um, even ones that we may not know about. They seem to have everything down. So doesn't that imply that? they would have some sort of understanding of a cosmic impact about to happen, and wouldn't that imply maybe they'd have adequate time to prepare for it, or at the very least leave some sort of blip or warning about an impact about to happen? Because, to my knowledge, I haven't seen any any glyphs or any of that warning us of a comet or something of that sort, so I was wondering if maybe you've seen, you've seen one like right. that? Or? Well, the, the first thing that strikes me is the fact that it's all you know, one of the universal uh, attributes of ancient cultures was their obsession with what was going on in the sky, <laughs> and their ability to. Uh, you see, when you look at these these ancient structures that are oriented to the plane of the ecliptic and the solstices and equinoxes, when you look at <clears throat> when you look at, for example, when uh, David Levy and Shoemaker, Eugene Shoemaker, uh, were able to to track the motion of the of the comet back in 1993. Uh, excuse me. They they were able to track it for over about a period of about three months after it emerged behind Jupiter. Now, what you had was a comet that had been sort of ping ponging between uh, the Sun and Jupiter multiple times, but we just never seen it. And if it was discovered, basically what it's doing is it's making kind of an elliptical loop around between Jupiter and the Sun, and at each each passage, it's being drawn closer into Jupiter's gravity field, right? So it came within the Roche limit, which is the region uh, within Jupiter's gravity field where the strength of the gravity can overcome yeah. the cohesiveness of the object and it begins to break apart. So when Shoemaker Levy was first discovered, it was in the very early stages of frag one cometary nucleus turned into 21 separate nuclei. Wow. Okay, after three months of tracking, uh, the astronomers were able to predict right down to the day when it was going to strike, that it was actually on its next passage out. It was going to make its aphelion passage crossing Jupiter's orbit right at the spot where Jupiter would then be, right? And they predicted to within the day that it was going to, you know, when the first fragment would would infall Jupiter. Well, the way they do that is through the, the cometary elements, which are all based upon the plane of the ecliptic, right? So you have several of these, uh, I'll, 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 it's hard to explain, I could actually pull up some, some graphics to show you, but basically you have a celestial reference frame that is all built upon this basic data, which is the ecliptic plane of the Earth, and the the equinoxes and the solstices. And so what they're doing, in effect, is the astronomers are using a, a, a system that was laid down thousands of years ago. And one of the consistent things that we see over and over again in these, you know, the ancient monumental architecture is that it's all oriented to the movements of the of the heavens. Duncan Steele, it's been years since I read this work of his, but Duncan Steele is an Australian astronomer who wrote a book, and in there I think he had a couple of chapters on um, how ancient, uh, what he called observatories, like Stonehenge and others, could actually potentially be used to predict celestial motion. Because for one thing, if you're going to make predictions about a comet, you have to have a reference frame. You can't just look at it moving randomly through space. You have to you have to tie its motion into something that's fixed. So that celestial reference frame becomes the, the, the means by which you can actually predict where something is moving. Once, once you have, see, so because 
everything is cyclic. So everything is moving in these geometries, right? Now, of course, this is oversimplified, but we can say that all the planetary uh, orbits are elliptical. The cometary orbits are elliptical. If if they're elliptical, that means they're basically closed. So it means they're they're going they're, they're coming into the sun, they're going out, they're coming back. If they're parabolic, they're open, which means it's, that's a long period comet, probably coming from uh, a far distant region of space like the Oort cloud. But if it's parabolic, it means it's coming in and it's going back out and it's never coming back. Hmm. Or it's going so far out that we can't we can't actually graph the ellipticity of its orbit. Because a parabola is open, and an ellipse, of course, is closed. So they were able to, to calculate that the uh, Shoemaker Levy 9 was, was um, you know, elliptical, and therefore was, had been on a regular, regular orbit around the sun. And, you know, as they're tracking asteroids now, that's the same thing that they're doing. They're looking at the orbital elements, because the orbital elements will tell it not only where it's been, but where it's coming back to. And that brings uh, brings us like to the work of going back to Fred Whipple, which I'm sure, George, you, you know Fred Whipple, right? He was mm -hmm. like one of the first. Yeah. Of course you do. Yeah. <laughs> so Fred Whipple was one of the first astronomers to study the torrid meteor streams. And what he was able to do is he took photographic evidence of several of the prominent meteors within that particular stream that were over a period of, long enough period of time that he was able to reproduce a section of the orbit. So now, knowing that, that, that being able to reproduce part of the geometry of the orbit and knowing its motion along that, you can now reconstruct the entire orbit. Now, what he did was he, he got enough data where he was able to regress. You know, he says, okay, it was here, it was here, it was here, it was here. Now, let's follow that back. So he took these, these meteors, began to follow them back, and then right, right when it got to about 5,000 years ago, he saw that several of these meteor streams converged onto the same spot, mm. which told him that there was a fragmentation that occurred there. See? So basically what Duncan Steele did, and I would have to you know, go back and reread, it's been at least a decade or 15 years since I read his work, but that was essentially what he was getting at is that if you are going to any, and I don't think he said this, but the implication was clear. In the aftermath of a catastrophe, if you were trying to recreate a celestial reference frame, the first thing you have to do is identify the solstices and the equinoxes. And then that gives you the, uh, the plane of the ecliptic. And then the rest of it is constructed on, on that reference plane. So that's what they were doing. Now, I think there could have been more to that. I think there definitely was more to that, because I see these ancient structures as being multifunctional. But one of the things could very well have been that they were using it to track celestial motion of things in the sky. And that brings us into some very interesting uh, areas that would be, I think, way beyond what they I They weren't think. just trying to figure out when to plant their spring crops. <laughs> you know, that's a they built Stonehenge so they could figure out when the hell to plant. I mean, that's for Yeah, you know, know uh, to me, it would, would be a lot easier to take maybe a, a six, six foot stick and put that in the ground. ground. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> or just see it's warming up. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ice yeah. and yeah. plant crops. Right, right, right. Ice exactly. <laughs> no need to move gigantic stones three, four hundred miles. But is, is there any record that you know of of? the ancients, whether it's Egypt, India, South America, trying to warn us about an imminent me comet impact slash asteroid? Do, do, do well, I kind of look at all of it mm -hmm. as being kind of a, as a warning, okay. particularly because, one again, one of the things universally is the idea of cyclicity, that mm -hmm. these are recurring yeah. events. Yeah. You know, look at, look at the Vedas, you know, the whole tradition of the Vedas from the Yugas and the Kalpas and all the, the sub yugas and everything are all cyclical. You look at the, the Sumerian king lists and you discover that they're built upon the same uh, hierarchical numbers, you know, as, as the Vedas. Um, oh. You look at the Mayans, you find the same thing the idea of cyclically recurring catastrophes. Native American traditions, same thing. So I think I look at the whole corpus of ancient traditions and see a lot of it. I, I, I see. Yeah, it's all kind of a warning in its own way. It's creepy. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, oh, another thank you, Joanna. Joanna. Appreciate it. Joanna. Hi, I'm Joanna. Joanna. I'm from Hi. London. Um, I'm a Who are you? Joanna. I'm from London. 
Hello, Hello Johanna. Johanna. Hi. I have a technical question about the comic in comet impact. Um, the fallout from the comet. How wide do we estimate that reached, and how fast did it reach that? Well, that would depend upon the wind velocity and the fallout. There's no radioactivity essentially, other than if it strips the ozone layer and you have cosmic ray bombardment. But that's not directly the consequence of, of the comet impact itself. But you know, it depends. Are you talking about a single impact or a multiple impact event? And I lean towards believing that the under driest boundary was a multiple impact event, not a single event. Okay. And, but what has happened is that, um, gosh, I could pull up some graphics here and show you, but Go right ahead. now, the proxy the evidence from the impact is covering, I think, and George can help me on this, at least I would say now a third of the globe, right? That's George? right. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere they've looked. And that's a third Basically, of the globe yeah. and, yeah. and four continents. Yeah. Uh, even if it even in the 20 sites or yeah. so. Oh, wow, yeah. okay. South America, South Africa, the U.S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it would, yeah. hit, it would hit across the Atlantic Ocean. And do we have any idea how long that would have taken, like a tsunami, to go from North America to Europe? Well, what do tsunamis move? One to 200 miles an hour when they're in oh, deep yeah. water? I've never done a calculation, but that'd be pretty easy to do. I could actually pull up my calculator right here that I never go anywhere without. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joanna may need to. Hey, somebody asked me that question. Okay. Jo Joanna's writing a screenplay on the Younger Dryas, and she's a talented actress and, and, and social media star. She has a 1 million Facebook followers. How about that, Randall? This young lady. I'm impressed. Well, yeah, you know, you write a screenplay. Get into it. Yeah. If you have questions uh, that I can't answer right off the top of my head, I probably have the answers somewhere, you know, in my archives. In my, you know, I have a massive online database. I also have because I've been collecting this information for really 25 years before there was even much of an internet. So. Uh, uh -huh. Chances are, if I don't have it, I could get my hands on it. So, you know, if you've got questions. Oh, please, thank you. I have so many. I want to I wanna get it technically right. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Yes, good for you. Because, look, the reality of it is so powerful and so dramatic that you don't really yeah. need to, no. to exactly. embellish it at all. Exactly. You need to work a gray-bearded prophet into your... <laughs> There's a role for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, how about me 30 years ago? <laughs> when, I, when I was was still good looking. Yeah. No, I know, I know. I, I'm still good looking, but... <laughs> You're breathtaking. <laughs> well, that's, oh, that's a term I hadn't used yet, but I think I'll, I'll start using that from now on. <laughs> oh, boy. Um... So, yeah, any other questions? Um, just just thinking thinking like I should show you a few things, things here. here. I can have one. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I'm Stefan from Sweden. I'm just curious if you have any evidence of a catastrophic event on the Scandinavian peninsula or, or uh, uh, you know what I mean, a, a cataclysmic or catastrophic event over Scandinavia during this over. Yeah, Scandinavia. Scandinavia. Over. Scandinavia. Over what? Scandinavia. Oh, Scandinavia. <laughs> <Yeah>, absolutely. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes. Tons, tons of it. Yeah. 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 Um, it depends on no, where you look at Google Earth. Yeah, yeah the, the uh, Scandinavia was under what's called the Fenno Scandian ice sheet, and it has all the all the evidence there that discuss that the Spino Scandian ice sheet underwent catastrophic melting. Oh, um, yes, absolutely. I, and in upcoming podcasts, I've been focusing on North America, but I'm slowly going to be expanding into these other areas, and I will be definitely devoting at least a couple of episodes to Northwestern Europe and, and Scandinavia, um, for sure. Yeah. Thanks. You Say know what? I'm half Scandinavian, so. Oh, perfect. That's right. Say hello yeah. to your shiny friends. <laughs> to who? Russ and Kai, your snake brother. The snake oh, brother. right. Sure. Uh, I will. Yes. yes. I'll, 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 I'll give, give, I'll give, give you your regards. regards. Got a lot of fans yeah. in this group. Yes. Hey, Randall, I had one for you. When did, you know, back in the 70s, you were very intuitive on a lot of this stuff and saw the geology for what it was. 
Um, when did you start, or was it at the same time, did you start to come to believe there may have been a precursor civilization? Was that, did that come along with, with Hancock's work and you were already a catastrophist? Because I know I became a catastrophist and now I've come to believe, you know, uh, that, sure. that, that, that there was some precursor. Did, did that right. happen at the same time or what? No, I would say, well, I, you know, I didn't, I discovered Hancock when uh, he came out with Fingerprints of the Gods. Mm -hmm. And when I read Fingerprints of the Gods, I was thinking, okay, now here's a guy who's thinking along the same track I'm thinking. He's taken the idea of, of an ancient civilization further than I had. But, but I had gone further into the specifics of the catastrophe. Mm -hmm. in, in, in Fingerprints of the Gods, he was invoking uh, Charles Hapgood's idea of a, of a crustal yeah. shift. Yeah. And he since abandoned that idea, pretty much, and has you know, embraced the idea of a cometary impact. Um, and a lot of the critics that attacked him attacked his work <laughs> fingerprints on the basis of his endorsement of Charles Hapgood. Yeah. Now what Charles Hapgood did, like Velikovsky, is he cataloged or documented a lot of evidence for catastrophes when nobody else was. And like Velikovsky, he attempted to uh, come up with some kind of an explanation for what could cause a global catastrophe. I, I uh, actually, let's see, discovered Hapgood's work in about 78. I had a, a, a fellow Masonic brother that was researching global catastrophes, and he turned me on to Charles Hapgood's work, and I was very interested in it, but nothing was available. I couldn't, there was no where to buy his work. It was out of print. And shortly thereafter, I just happened to go to a library book sale, and what did I see was Path of the Pole, Charles Hapgood's book sitting right there for sale for like 50 cents or something. So obviously I snatched it up. And he has a, had a bibliography of, God, I don't know, 300 and some references in there that um, was most of what you could uh, access at that time on <clears throat> catastrophes and so on. So I made it my goal to try to track down as many of those references as I could. So I started hanging out in the library of Emory University here, Georgia Tech, Georgia State. There is a, uh, DeKalb County has a science center uh, called Fernbank Science Center, and they had a, have a science library there that was actually open to the public and nobody hardly ever used it. So I went in there and kind of became a regular there. This would have been in the in the 80s and got to know the librarian and, and she you know got her interested in what i was doing and at that time they were linked into the whole interlibrary loan system so because of that i was able to track down most of hapgood's references and i have them all now you know bound actually this is what i did i took those references like see this is mm. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, backwards. Wow. Oh, the Library of Carlson. Oh, yeah. What it says is Mega Floods Volume Two. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean this is this is like research that I you know collect this is all pre internet, see. Mm -hmm. This is from haunting yes. university libraries. <laughs> Those are ancient papyrus. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the library is where they were stored. <laughs> Every town would have one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I used, I used um, you know, uh, Hapgood's bibliography. And at that point, I was totally hooked on catastrophism. And, and of course, I began to think in those, you know, I began to think along the lines of, well, what, what was going on? You know, and, and because I'd also, I loved mythology since I was a kid. So I had studied and read a lot of mythology and was very curious about the origins of some of these. So the Scandinavian stories of the, the, the uh, you know, Ragnarok and the, the um, you know, the wars of the gods and, and all of that, I found extremely intriguing, even, even kind of disturbing in some ways. But uh, I think it was about uh, oh, probably 77, 78, 79, right in there that I read the work of Ignatius Donnelly, mm -hmm. which again, George, I'm sure you're familiar with Ignatius. Great um, stuff. He wrote the two, two books on Atlantis. One mm -hmm. of them was Ragnarok, The Age of Fire and Gravel. And at the conclusion of that book, which was written, I think it came out in 1883, mm -hmm. you know, he was the Congressman for Minnesota 
who ran for Congress so he could get to Washington so he'd have access to the uh, Library of Congress. Ah, yep. And he spent, spent all of his spare time in the Library of Congress researching Atlantis. Yeah. <laughs> so, awesome. so I read that book, and his conclusion at the end of the book was that, that the catastrophe was triggered by a comet impact. And then that took me back to all oh, the work of of um, of uh, Halley and Wiston, uh, Wiston and those Winston. guys who were invoking cometary impacts way back in the you know 1600s, 1700s. Um, I would guess though that where I really got interested in the idea of what may have been going on in terms of civilization or culture during or during those ages was. More in the 90s, I was definitely thinking about that by the time I read Fingerprints. Mm -hmm. um, but I always felt like his work and my work sort of complemented each other because he had gone, again, he had gone more and emphasized the, the evidence for, you know, Ice Age or early Paleolithic cultural activity. And I had really focused on the catastrophism side of it. So when we finally met around 12 years ago, I guess, and had discussions, it sort of, you know, we came to the realization that, you know, he saw that my work actually supported his because it mm -hmm. it really provided the answer to so many of his critics. Like, well, where are the, where's the pottery? You know, where's the evidence you're talking about? You know, where are the rusted car bodies or, you know, mm -hmm. the old, you know, computer monitors or whatever you're supposed to find that's going to indicate that there was some kind of thing called civilization back in the Ice Age. But what I've been doing shows conclusively why whatever was going on, you'd be, you know, would be very scarce at this point. It might be, for example, a large statue that's actually sculpted out of bedrock. Like, yeah. For example, the Sphinx. That's right. Or, you know, a gigantic 480 foot tall pyramidal structure. Right. And I've often wondered, you know, if the limestone uh, casing stones had not been stripped from the pyramid. What would what story would they have to tell? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things I've often wondered is could there have been high water marks? Well, 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 that's exactly. that way of now. Well, well, actually, uh, Randall, it's been just it, when you do get a chance to come over here, we'll have to connect you with our guide Yusuf because he's lived his entire life over here across the road from the Sphinx, and he was telling me today. And he's had geologist Susan Moore, who's worked with him uh, quite a bit, and they, he thinks he's found what he would indicate as essentially flood damage up on the plateau in some of the limestone blocks around the second pyramid and behind the gate of the crow. Uh, uh, really? Yeah, he's also found like Neolithic tool points and stuff up here. So yeah, he's, he's got some interesting evidence that hopefully I'll get to document a bit more with him while we're here. But there is, I think there is some evidence for that up on the plateau, it's certainly what Yusuf and Susan Moore think is 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 quite likely uh, flood damage. I mean, uh -huh. for that matter, I mean Petrie himself also talked about the great uh, floods of the Nile. Like he found in some of his work, um, you know, evidence for this catastrophic flooding of the Nile, which he was kind of laughed at a little bit for. But that's he he reports that in a couple of his books. Uh huh. If Flinders Petrie, yes, you're saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I will. Um I have not been here, but this is a good example of some of the studies I found on the Wadis, uh, you know, which are these erosional canyons that are almost identical to some of these mm -hmm. erosional can canyons that I've been looking at all over the uh, western states. Yep. Let me see if I can do it. Yeah, it goes. Well, it's too, too complicated here. Let me see if I can do a screen share. Uh, this While you're working on I wonder whether uh, Egypt has any LIDAR yet. Sure would be interesting to see the Nile Valley. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, let's see. Most has disabled participants screen here. Yeah, let me uh, let me just undisable that. <laughs> okay. Uh, how do I do that? Shit. Uh, yeah. Try that. There we go. And, and Randall, this camera might go blank for a minute. I'm just going to change the battery in it. So keep talking. Sure. We'll, we'll be back. All right. Well, well this, this is the mouth of a lot right, right here. here. Yeah. And, and what you're seeing is the sediment, sediment load that was, that was being carried, carried by the water to cut the, 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 the lot. 
Wow. Yeah, that, that, that boulder, boulder has to be 20 feet along the long axis. axis. Right. Now, the, the basic, basic idea, idea here is that whatever, whatever force, hydraulic force, force originally transported these boulders has, has not, not been operational even remotely close, close to this scale since this event. event. So, so you can, can see, see this is this is the mouth of this is the kind, kind of rubble. rubble. So, so this is material that is being carried by the water. water. Now, of course, course there's, there's no water, water here now. now. But this, this is the kind, kind of thing you look for uh, as, as evidence, evidence of these past events. events. This, this is, is called, called the boulder leg right, right here. here. And what, what a boulder, boulder leg is, is, is where you have, have a, a sediment deposit that's charged with um, all degrees of sediment size from, from fine sand to silt, all the way up to cobbles and boulders. Like when, when the water comes in and it, 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 it's, let's, let's say it's confined to a channel, it's, it's moving, moving fast. And, and when it's moving fast, it's erosive. If it comes to an opening where it opens up into a basin, the water spreads out, slows down, and drops its sediment below. And this is what we see right here. So we're looking up into a canyon. The water, the water is coming, coming through the canyon, the canyon and it opens into this basin, basin and its sediment load gets, gets dropped. dropped. Okay, okay, so, so when the sediment load gets dropped, gets dropped one, of one of the things that happens is that, 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 that the residual currents and water, water flows will winnow away, away the finer sediment, sediment and, it and it leaves a layer, a layer of boulders. This is called the boulder lag. And this is dashed white line is showing the water mark right here. So at the time, that the, that the water, water opened, opened out, out, spread out, out, spread out, out into, into this, this basin. basin. It, it, now, of course, course, it would have been much deeper, deeper since it's confined to the channel. channel. It, would it would probably be up, up to the very top, top of the channel, channel walls. walls. But once, once it opens, it opens into the basin, basin the, level the level of the water drops, drops it slows, slows down, down its competency to carry, carry uh, sediment load, load diminishes, diminishes as the current drops in velocity, and it begins to deposit its sediment. And so, this, this kind of stuff, stuff is found, found all over Egypt, Egypt when you when go you to the wadis. And, and what you're seeing here is called imbrication. And only water, water does this, the way, the way it stacks, stacks up yeah. the rocks. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. yeah. That is cool, Red. I'd love to see some of those sites. I know one of them's Wild Nile. That gets you there, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's easy. All right. All right. So, so I'll, I'll stop, stop the share there. there. But that, but that gives, gives you an idea. idea. So, so just, just like with in, in, in these past, past events, events, you have, you have to, to reconstruct them by, by looking at the evidence, evidence that they've left, left in, the in the environment. Whether, Whether it's micro scale, scale like, like we're looking, looking at so much, much for the younger, younger dryas, you know, it could be magnetic grains, or magnetic spherules, it could be nano diamonds, you know, it could be iridium deposits or osmium, but it's micro scale. So you got that left. What, what I, I just showed, showed you is an example, example of macro scale, scale right? right? So, so I kind, I kind of, look of look at it, you know, really, really what we're doing, we're kind of like, like um, um, you know, you this, know this, is, this is forensic detective work because, because we're, we're trying, trying to reconstruct, reconstruct the, details the details of past, past events. events. And, and the, 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 uh, uh, all we all have to go on is the clues that have been left behind. And, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we didn't have no access to the micro scale. We had, we no, had basis, no basis, as George, George will confirm, confirm we, had we had really no basis, basis for studying nanodiamonds. You know, you know, we, we needed, needed scanning electron, electron microscopes, and we needed uh, uh, energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy, spectroscopy. And we needed a whole host of, 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 of new, new technologies, technologies that allows us now to see that there, there is this layer, layer at the, at the Younger Rise boundary, boundary that, that is, is the imprint of the cosmic event. But, but then, then, on the other hand, we've got, got the macro scale phenomenon, phenomenon, phenomenon that, that shows us that there were these massive, massive floods. floods. And, and studies, studies going back, back to the early 70s, 70s uh, led, led to, the, to what, what we call the, the, uh, the energy, energy paradox. paradox. When, when the first, the first uh, you, know, you know, prior, prior to radiocarbon radio carbon data, data, the assumptions were that, uh, that you know, the, the, the deep glaciation process took tens of thousands of years. And this is based upon modern observations. Of, of, the, the, of, of the recession, recession rate, rate of, of Little, little ice, ice Age glaciers. glaciers. You know, you know during, during the Little Ice, ice Age, which lasted roughly, roughly, roughly half, half a millennium, millennium ended, ended like, like in the early 1800s, 1800s to mid 1800s, 1800s. Worldwide, worldwide glaciers grew to the largest, largest extent, extent that they had been in, in 10, 10 to 12,000 12, years, years since, since the, the end of the Big Ice Age. Age. So, so the early, early geologists 
uh, going, going back, back to, to, to William Buckland, Buckland to Kuvier, and Kuvier, and Lewis Agassi, and, 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 and all, all of these guys, guys were able, able to actually observe firsthand the, the recession of the Lysate glaciers, and were able to see how they had constructed borings. You know, they, they could see glaciers, they could see terminal borings, they could see medial borings, they could see lateral borings, esters. You know, you know, so, so they, they, they were, were able to see the effects, effects of the deglaciation, and they were also able to measure its rates. Based, based upon that, that extrapolating backwards to the, to the scale of the, the, of the great ice sheets, sheets at the, the end of the Pleistocene, it was natural, natural to assume, assume that, that it would have taken, taken tens of thousands of years for that, that ice, ice to ultimately melt away. away. Right? right? Well, now well, here comes radiocarbon dating in the 50s, and by, By the early, early 70s, you had 20, 20 years, years of accumulated radiocarbon radio 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 And what that did was completely blew throughout this, this whole protracted glacier recession model because what they found was that there was evidence of forests growing in Canada 35 and 40,000 years ago, which would have been right almost at the center of the whole mm -hmm. ice complex. Well. What happens now is the timeline where you've got tens of thousands of years to, uh, to, to go into an ice age, tens of thousands of years to come out of it, suddenly that gets compressed drastically, see? So one of the things that became apparent was by looking at areas where, okay, so let's see, let's say Northern Michigan, there's no, no trees growing there, and there's evidence that the ice was there and then suddenly there's evidence of pollen and seeds and vegetation showing up, say, 13,000 years ago, right? Well, now it's obvious, okay, when the ice was down here, built this terminal worry, we look into that terminal worry, we find some organic stuff, we can date it about 15, 16,000 years ago, okay? So we know the ice was there, right? Well, now you go north of there and you find pollen from spruce trees. When you date that pollen, you discover, okay, well, this pollen, the ice was not there 12,000 years ago because there was a spruce forest growing there, right? Spruces or alders or larch trees, the kind of trees that grow in a north, northern climate. And so by reconstructing this pattern of deglaciation, what it did was it confronted them with what they call the energy paradox. And the energy paradox is this. You've got roughly 6 million cubic miles of glacial ice piled up covering over half of North America, in some places perhaps up to two miles thick, right? You got the Cordilleran ice sheet over Western Canada, you got the Laurentide ice sheet centered over Hudson Bay. Between the two of those, you've got as much mass, ice glacier mass, as you do today or more in Antarctica and Greenland combined. And that doesn't even include the Fennoscandian ice sheet over Northern Europe, okay? Now, that ice is there between 13 and 15,000 years ago, and by eight or 9,000 years mm -hmm. ago, it's gone. Okay, how do you explain that? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you gotta Ooh. obviously melt the ice, <laughs> right? But it takes heat, it takes thermal energy to melt the ice. And hence the paradox was, where did the thermal energy come from that could melt ice that fast? And the answer was, nobody could figure it out. So they had a conference in 1973, uh, looking at the, the problem, didn't come up with any solution. They said, let's give them a couple of years and reconvene. They had a second conference in 1975. Same thing. They could not, and in fact, if anything, the, the time period got even more constricted as more radiocarbon dates became available. So what they realized was, okay, if we assume that the, that the ice sheet is retracting from its, like, say, southernmost uh, extension, which east of the Mississippi was like 38 degrees north latitude. It's receding back, it's receding, and so now we have to basically get rid of the whole ice complex. It's gotta be gone because there's no glacier over Hudson Bay anymore, right? So how fast does it have to be receding? Well, it had to be receding at, on an average of 800 feet every year for the full 5,000 years. But the other thing that was perplexing was as they began to track the rate of recession of the southern margin, the northern margin was receding just as fast. They said, how the hell do you explain that? Well, now fast forward to the late 80s and early 90s in the work of John Shaw. 
and his reinterpretation of drumlins. Now, drumlins have been, there are these amazing elongated hills that have been associated with glaciers going back at least 150 years, right? And many places where there were glaciers, you find these drumlins, which are these elongated, boat hull shaped hills, right? They always behind the moraines. So they're always assumed to have been under the ice. So the assumption was is that the ice is somehow moving over the glacial till. So, so here's the sequence. The ice is moving in. The tremendous weight of this ice crushes the ground, the bedrock, grinds it up, pulverizes it, and leaves a thick layer of glacial till. Now, somehow the glacier then shapes that till into these streamlined hills. And I'm going to show you... Uh, I'm going to show you so you know exactly what I'm talking about here. I'm going to go back to the share screen, um, and you'll be able to see exactly what I am talking about. Share screen, here we go. Let's find um, And then, Randall, um, after you get that, we'll start winding it up because we've got an early day tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, and I have to get, get back to, to making some money. Um, <laughs> okay, let's see here. All right, can we see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are drumlins, drumlin swarms, and there's thousands of them, thousands of them. So I'll just give you uh, one example here. This is Lake Ontario, and all around Lake Ontario are these enormous drumlin fields. And if we look at just south of Lake Ontario here, where my uh, cursor is, just north of the Finger Lakes, and if we want to zoom in, this is the kind of stuff we see is thousands of drumlins thousands of them and basically what we if we track the drumlins we discover that they're splayed out in a radial pattern here and if we follow that radial pattern it leads to a, a, an epicenter in eastern ontario right and it's interesting let's see if i can get this here so you see it in the, Okay, so what I want you to see is the Finger Lakes are, are also a radial pattern. Oh. Now, the ice sheet at the Younger Dryas was probably terminated right here at the northern end of the Finger Lakes. Well, if you follow the trend, the, 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 the radial trend of the drumlin swarms, they point to the same region that if you follow the axis of the Finger Lakes, is centered on the eastern basin of Lake Ontario, right directly on top of a deep, dramatically scoured basin. Hmm, mm -hmm. rather interesting, right? Wouldn't you say? Yeah. So, what I'm what I'm theorizing is that this may have been an impact epicenter right here. And what John Shaw did was he, through his studies of, of drumlets, he concluded that they were produced by gigantic subglacial, high pressure subglacial floods, massive amounts of water forcing their way under the ice sheets, right? Oh. Now, the critics did not like that idea. The main reason being is that the volumes of water required to support Shaw's um, hydrological processes uh, Genesis was so huge that they just didn't even want to address the issue. But what I've done is I'm, I'm right now part of my uh, uh, my uh, current research is uh, mapping the drumlin fields. And here's what the drumlins are showing us. It's showing us that the melting of the ice sheets did not proceed in an orderly fashion from its margin but there were actually massive catastrophic meltwater events that radiated from epicenters far up within the ice sheet itself, not the margins of the ice sheet. Mm -hmm. What that implies to me is that there had to be some influx of energy that almost point source of energy that could produce tremendous volumes of meltwater that could then lift the ice sheet from oh. the substrate, force its way under and create the drumlin fields. This is, this is a bathymetric 
a, a, a chart showing the glacially scoured rock droplets that's on the floor of Eastern Lake Ontario. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, on December 2nd, you guys were over in Egypt, you may have not heard about this. We've been talking in my podcast about this potential uh, Eastern Basin of Lake Ontario as a potential impact site. Uh, we recorded a, uh, a Cosmographia podcast episode on November 30th, in which we spent the whole time looking at the Drumlin Fields, the, uh, the Finger Lakes, the orientation, and hypothesizing that there was an impact uh, over the ice sheet on Eastern Lake Ontario. And then two days later, as it says here, a momentous boom rocked parts of Upper New York State on December 2nd after an exceptionally large meteor infiltrated the Earth's atmosphere. The explosive flash produced a brilliant shadow across the city of Toronto, and the far-reaching roar from the explosion created seismic-like shaking across portions of North Central New York. Oh. When? That's the fifth? Yeah, we missed it. We were a few wow. heads down here. That was on the 2nd. <laughs> wow. So the second December. Even that so boom, I, shaking. I, yeah, I took that as confirmation. I said, okay, well, they are paying attention. They're watching my podcast. Let <laughs> me know. This is a drumlet, what it looks like, a wow. photograph. Wow. Yes. Here's another one. And what's interesting about drumlins is this, they're, they're paleocurrent indicators because the flow in this case is left to right because all drumlets have a blunt end and a long tapered end. The Stoss end is the up current end and the long tapered bit is the down current end. So if you look at this hill here, you see this is a blunt end and this is the long tapered end. So this water came from left to right. And the glaciers here at the time that this flood occurred were probably between two and 3,000 feet thick. <laughs> so so anyways, yeah, that's a big part of what, what I've been doing lately. Uh, here's maps that I'm creating to track the Drumlin fields. And I'll just let you take a quick look at this. Uh, I think we have some interesting geomorphology coming right down along this sloth right here. But we'll save that for another another time. Uh, if you give me two more minutes, you may remember this, George. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Malcolm LeCompte was the co-author of this paper mm -hmm. along with Demetroff. Uh, George and I were at a, at a round table with these guys a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, LeCompte was the, the fellow that came on uh, to kind of buttress when, when I did the Joe Rogan show with Graham Hancock, the famous debate with skeptic Michael Shermer. Yeah. Hopefully, <laughs> some of you have seen that. Okay, so anyways, yeah. he, they were looking at microspheral evidence in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Mm. They looked at the geochemistry of these microspherals and as it says here, the rare earth element patterns of strontium and neodymium isotopes of the spherules indicate that their source lies in a 1.5 billion year old Cabeshia terrain in the Grenville province of northeastern North America. The, this study ties the spherules recovered in Pennsylvania and New Jersey to an impact to Quebec about 12,900 years ago at the onset of the Younger Drives. And, and if we go to that Quebecia terrain, you can see it's right up here. This is the St. Lawrence Seaway coming down here. Here's the Cabachia train right here. This whole thing is the Grenvellian province, right? It's a whole series of accreted terrains, but the, 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 the geochemical signature of each of these accreted terrains is very unique. So these microspherals had the geochemistry of this, of this region right here. So now check this out. Here it is, right? Now, see that dot? That dot is Lake St. Jean, oh. and here is Lake St. Jean, right here. Mm -hmm. Right there, centered in the very limited region that these microspherals emanated from, Lecompte and his crew uh, estimated that it would be close to 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit to produce the chemistry of these microspherals. Coming off the southeast flank of this basin right here was a catastrophic outflow right here that left um, left a uh, a room of catastrophic outflow. So we have a deep basin. We have to come from this area right here. So I would suggest that this basin of Lake St. Jean as a potential impact site. 
and by the, its numerous parallels with Lake Nipigon over here, I would suggest the same thing as another potential impact site right here. Interestingly, James Teller, the paleohydrologist, has been doing work on this and has dated the catastrophic outflow from the basin of Lake Nipigon right to 12,900 years ago. Yeah. So I got lots, 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 lots more stuff to share. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna hit it, Randall. This is awesome, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh oh. Oh no. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bye, Randall. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We uh, okay. So let's do this. Uh, when you guys get back, you know, come on, tune in. Go to RandallCarlson.com, and that'll get you to everywhere. That all the stuff that I'm into. George and I are going to be doing a lot of work together going into the future. I have no doubt of that. I uh, know and, so. uh, Yeah. And whoever else is doing work in this, I think that what we need is a is a global team mm. that we're working and sharing information, trying to get this inf knowledge out there, trying to um, you know stimulate the impetus to really begin to to look at deep history, to look at the potential of our own future, what this deep history applies for our future um from my perspective there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done yeah, yeah. and uh i can't think of anything more interesting or fun for me what i could possibly do, be doing for the rest of my 50 to 100 years on this planet <laughs> <laughs> i know george and i are going to be george listen man you got to get down to decatur and i'll buy yeah. you dinner that's right. In the man. wheelhouse craft pub and kitchen. And we'll figure out the rest of it. <laughs> and anybody else, too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, uh, we'll do that. We'll, like I said, we'll, you and I will figure figure out the answer to all the mysteries over fish tacos. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful, buddy. I look forward to it. <laughs> Me, too. All righty. When do you guys come back? When's the trip over? Uh, Saturday. 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 Unfortunately. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, Ben, if you want to hit me up after you get back, we can set up a, a podcast okay. interview and oh. that'd, that'd be great yeah. Yeah. we look forward to seeing you on Rogan soon too yeah, yeah. oh that's, that'll happen good good <laughs> good 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 a lot of people wait well, well, I, 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 I've been getting a couple of reports uh, from people that said I was listening to Rogan last week and he said on there he wants to get you back on so oh, good. I yeah. said okay oh. well I yeah. guess that's my that's my signal hell yeah <laughs> I can oh, yeah. do it but George, I got a, a, a really a bunch of interesting things coming up, so mm -hmm. we'll talk about that, George. Terrific, Randall. Well, thank you so much, man. Thank you, Randall. 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 Thanks, Mike. Cheers. That guy. See ya. Knowledge inside.